So uh, my name is Eiichi Chigami. Uh, I'm from uh, Stewart at the University of Arizona. I'm a member of the Near Camp team. And uh, I'm actually the, the real expert with uh, Near Camp Grism spectroscopy is Tom Green. And the, he, he, he'll have a talk later today about uh, single object spectroscopy, transit planets and stuff. And also, uh, I, I, uh, I received some material from St John Stansberry, Noor Pirtzkal, and uh, Gabe Brammer. So this is outline of my talk. So first I will, well, some of you may wonder why does NearCam, why NearCam has, a, has grism, grisms in it. So the, the, I'll explain why, as I understand. And then uh, I'll explain the, the wide field spectroscope, slitless spectroscopy mode of NearCam. And then I think probably the most people, what most people want to know is the, what, what's the benefit of uh, NearCam agrees spectro slitless spectroscopy mode against NERSPEC MOS. So that's something I, I, I'll discuss. And then I'll present examples of some science applications. And right now, uh, the people at group at SDSCI is uh, finalizing the AOT design for near cam grism uh, observations. And uh, I'll highlight some key points. And then there are some data simulators. So I, I'll present a few of those and then give you a summary. So first question is, why do we have grisms in near cam? And this is before my time, so uh, this is the information I received from other people in the team. So originally, well, of, of course, some of you may know much better than I do, but many people outside the JW near cam team and the JWST community may not know, so I'll just describe why we have grisms. So originally, this was grisms were developed and installed for initial course uh, phasing of the JWST mirror segments. But it turns out that the grism is no longer needed for this purpose because uh, deployment errors of the mirror segments will likely be within the dynamic range of uh, uh, dispersed Hartmann sensors. So we could directly go to DHS, uh, uh, DHS without going through near cam, uh, near cam grism. So original purpose of having near, near cam grisms is sort of, uh, the original reason is sort of uh, no longer valid, but then there, there are a few, few things which Grism can still do, like checking the uh, I, H2O ice deposit on the near cam pickoff mirror during the commissioning. But the main thing is that, the uh, most important thing is that near cam Grism <laughs> offers a completely uh, separate uh, science observing mode, which is this wide field slitless, slitless spectroscopy. So that's what I'm going to describe during my, in this presentation. So this is a quick summary of the, what Grism, near cam Grism wide field spectro, slitless spectroscopy does. So for main references, uh, I, I suggest that you look at two SPIE papers written by Tom Green, and especially the la latest one, which was uh, uh, prepared this, this summer. This is the most important, probably, source of information for all of you. So first, the wavelength coverage from 2.4 to 5 micron, and, uh, th which means uh, this is only uh, available for the long wavelength channel of the near cam. And then resolving power is in this range, and the pixel scale is this. And there are two, each, each module has two grisms whose dispersion directions are perpendicular to, perpendicular to each other, so that you can break confusion. And then I, I would like to also uh, emphasize that the sensitivities are not the same for the two modules because the two grisms are physically different. Uh, the, the grism in the module A have uh, anti-reflection coating on both sides, but uh, in the, the one in the module B, it has only one side uh, coated with anti-reflection coating. So uh, uh, this results in a loss of throughput about 25% per in the module. 
And uh, this schematically shows how it works. So the, basically, the, the, the undeviated point wavelength is 3.95 microns, so roughly 4 microns. So the 4 micron light would go straight through the grism without getting dispersed. But then, um, the depending, so the basically the grism will disperse light over like here in this range from 2.4 to 5. And the depending on where you place the source, for example, if, if you place the source at one, one edge of the detector, then this is how the dispersed light would uh, fall into the detector. And uh, this is for a longer wavelength uh, grisms. The direction is actually, the, the, so here, wavelength is going, going up, up to the right. But actual, in the actual detectors, it's actually the opposite. That's why this, this uh, minus x, that's what this minus x means. And this is sort of more realistic simulation of how dispersed light will fall. So these are the, uh, source, the, the artificial source positions. And then here again, the x side is uh, flipped from the real direction. So the wavelength is going upward to the right. And so if you place a source here, then the, the, this, this grism, shorter wavelength grism, will disperse light from here to here. So this is the shorter wavelength. This is the, this is the longer wavelength. And th this, is, uh, this is also, uh, so f four mi micron would fall here. So four micron right would fall here because it's undeviated. And so this is the range with slightly narrower uh, filter. And uh, this, this, this filter, actually, the, the light gets dispersed mainly to the right-hand side. And th this is an artifact of, produced by CO2 ice, which we saw in CV2. So this is not a real feature of the grism or anything. But as you can see, for example, in order to uh, observe, obtain the full spectrum with this filter, for example, the source has to be fairly close to this side, otherwise the spectrum would fall, fall off from this direction to this direction. And uh, so, so in order, well, in order to get full coverage for a wide, for wide filter, you need to be careful about where you place the source. And this, this roughly shows, well, this is a spectrum we took during the CV2, so that gives an idea of how things look like. And, uh, the overall, uh, the curve is not uh, reflecting the sensitivity or anything. It's just the color of the lamp. So that's why it's cutting off shortly, uh, steeply at longer wavelength. And uh, there are a bunch of filters you could potentially use. But the, the, uh, basically, we, we can ch cover the whole range with uh, 322 W2 and uh, this 444 W. But of course, if you, if you use narrow filters, then the, it's easy to get full wavelength coverage from larger number of sources. And this is, the, this is uh, some plots from the Tom's paper. So this is the grading efficiency. This is the throughput with filter and now the telescope optics, the, all, all the, uh, the throughput uh, besides grading. So the, to, to get a total throughput, you basically multiply these two curves. And then this is the resolving power. And it's actually dropping to shorter wavelength because uh, in the long, long, wavelength channel, long wavelength channel, the, the PSF is critically sampled around 4 micron. So, that, that's, so, so the shorter wavelength, uh, the PSF gets smaller and smaller, but the, your, your, your PSF sam sampling is basically limited by the pixel scale. So the, the, it's under sample. So the, the, your delta lambda is always two pixels. While, so that, that's why the, this is decreasing as a function of lambda, because delta lambda is constant while lambda is dropping. Uh, but at, at longer wavelength, on the other hand, the PSF is oversampled. So here, the, the PSF size increases as a, in, linearly with the uh, lambda. So that's why it stays constant at longer wavelengths. So that roughly from 1,200 to 1,550. So this, this is probably the, the information you, you would probably most care about. So I'll try to highlight some 
pros and cons. So near cam grism versus nurse spec. So near cam grism is uh, uh, slightly higher, sm smaller pixel scale, so better spatial sampling, and also uh, spectral photometric accuracy is higher because there's no slit. And the field of view is similar to nurse spec. However, I, sh I should emphasize that the sensitivity is factor two to three, or depending on the filter, could be factor several less sensitive than nurse spec. And then the wavelength cover is also limited, and uh, also confusion would be an issue if you go deep, very deep, or observe crowded fields. So, so what does this mean? So practical consideration, these, these are a few pieces of advice I would give from my perspective. So, if you already have a list of targets to go to, then you're unlikely to benefit from this mode, near cam grism white fields with this mode, because nerve spec is more sensitive. So you already know which sources to look at. You just cut, you just use nerve spec and target those sources. However, a near cam uh, white field spectros spectroscopy mode does provide unique and powerful capabilities, and these are a few examples. For example, blind search for sources with strong spectral features, and also spatial resolve, resolve spectroscopy for a large number of objects simultaneously. So basically, with IFU, you're looking at basically single source, a small number of sources at one time, but you can think of slitless spectroscopy, wide field slitless spectroscopy as a IFU with a, with a with with a, lot, a huge field of view of serving a lot of uh, sources. And uh, of course, I would suggest that if possible, you should avoid crowded regions or uh, long integrations. And uh, <coughs> as was the case with HST already, the, the, this, could, this grism slitless mode could be a good, uh, efficient, and effective uh, way of utilizing the parallel time. So some examples of uh, science applications. So this is galactic uh, example. So th th this, is, this is a simulated image. And then here, uh, a fairly uh, narrow filter is used. So each spectrum is fairly short, which is good, because it will avoid confusion. And then the idea here is that there's a, this dark cloud <coughs> and uh, at, at font for micron, the, you can penetrate this dark cloud and start to see the background uh, stars. And if this dark cloud contains a lot of dust grains with uh, ice on it, then we, we might be able to see it as uh, absorption line features at, in this case, 4.3 micron. So this is one way to uh, uh, use uh, this mode. And since I, I'm extragalactic, I'm more interested in this kind of uh, application, which is the search for high-Z strong line emitters. And this is uh, XCF real image. And from this, just I simulated near cam image with 3.56 micron filter, and then dispersed with grism. Uh, and the here, uh, the, the, the distribution of uh, source brightnesses reflect the actual distribution of sources seen in the XEF. But here, I, I, I just assumed all the sources to be redshift 6 and inserted uh, reasonable strength uh, emission lines and tried to, uh, tried to gauge you know, how, what, how the detectability of these lines change as a function of source brightness and also how the wavelength coverage changes from one side to the other. And so with, uh, with this mode, we can trace these lines in these kind of red shifts, which would be really new and spectacular. And this is a so zoom up of this uh, simulated spectra I already showed you. So that this is HB, this is redshift six, and this is HB. Of, this is O3 triplet, uh, sorry doublet. And then, of course, it's easy to see these bright lines, and you can see that there are these lines coming from fainter galaxies. And the challenge would be uh, to detect these 
these emission lines from high-D sources because most cases we, we wouldn't necessarily expect to see continuum from these sources. So the question is, can we really identify these blobs from coming from high redshift galaxies? And uh, the good thing, it, one, one good thing is that the, at this redshift, using different filters, we can, we can detect different lines. For example, using another filter, we can, for example, try, uh, detect H alpha. And we could do this event redshift 9. So this is O2, and this is HB02. So by taking uh, data with different filters, targeting different lines, we could try to identify emission, strong emission line sources at high redshift. And just to give you an idea, so th this is the GRISM sensitivity, and this is NERSPEC MOS sensitivity with these parameters. So of course, NERSPEC is more sensitive. And if we uh, assume this kind of equi equivalent will for this line at this redshift, then the GRISM would lose this line around the 26th magnitude or something, and that the, the NERSPEC would go deeper. But there are already indications that the high-Z galaxies might have much stronger emission lines. And these are the, uh, the ob observations uh, published observations setting up lower limits for these line strength. So if you assume that the equivalent width of 1,000 Armstrong, then even GRISM can detect galaxies down to 28.5 magnitude, which is quite deep. So the, the usefulness of this mode is that if high-Z galaxies are re have really strong lines, then this, this mode could be very useful. And a few words about the AOT. So one thing you should note is that actually sources outside the field of view, imaging field of view can still produce spectra inside the uh, GRISM data. So for example, sources, so this is the imaging field of view, and sources on, in this side and also in this side, uh, inside blue squares or red squares, they could still produce spectra in, in the actual data, data set. So the, um, the, the actual AOT will likely have built-in offsets to image areas slightly uh, around this one single field of view so that we, we, we will also capture sources outside, in, sitting in here and here. Actually, the, the cut, actual cut is made by the uh, peak of mirror. That, that, that basically uh, limits the sources that could produce spectra in the data. So, we want to cover these regions between dashed lines and the actual detector this side and same here. And also the idea is that, that while taking long wavelengths GRISM, uh, that we will keep running short wavelength imager so that we will also taking image, short wavelength images at the same time. And there's simu so right now there are three simulation tools. And this is basically AxiSim developed for HST with a, gris, a near cam GRISM configuration file. So this is what I used to simulate those images I showed you. And there's another one uh, being developed by Noor, and I guess he has a poster. And then there's another one, which is Grizzly, which is being developed by Gabe Brammer. So th these are three simulators we have right now. And I already showed, showed some uh, images data from this. And the second one, the third one, so this is the image I just got from Noah this morning. And then there's a Gabe Brammer's uh, simulation. So there's three different simulators. And the summary, so as I said, you already know which sources to look at. You don't necessarily have to use this mode. Uh, NERSPEC is more sensitive. But NERSPEC near cam GRISM does provide uh, unique and uh, powerful capabilities uh, with this mode. And for more details, please uh, go to this paper, uh, which was published recently. And there will be also Tom's talk this afternoon about uh, GRISM spectroscopy for single objects and time series uh, spectroscopy. Thank you very much. Thank you.